next speaker is Professor Trevor Marshall. My slides, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Well, who am I? On this slide, it says that I'm associated with the Autoimmunity Research Foundation in California, and I'm an adjunct faculty of health sciences, Murdoch University, West Australia. Next slide, please. So what do I do? Well, what I do is focus on metagenomics and microbiome. Metagenomics is multiple genome. It's beyond the genome. It's looking at the way the human genome interacts with the other genomes in our body. Uh, it's way beyond looking at genetic um, uh, mutations. It's looking at the interactome and uh, particularly focused on the metagenomics of the microbiome. Big words, don't worry about them. Next slide, please. <laughs> the, the, the economist tells you what you need to know. Microbes maketh man. This is knowledge that has come up in the last three years, although we've been working on it for a decade now, uh, which is basically there are a whole lot of microbes which are part of the human experience. They're part of us, an essential part of uh, every uh, the operation of every organ in our body. Next slide, please. So we spread the knowledge that we had uh, because what we developed was uh, pathways whereby microbes that were living inside nucleated cells of the human body could actually cause disease processes, could cause the human genome to not translate cor correctly, not transcribe correctly. Um, and uh, that information was acted on by uh, clinical collaborators all over the world. Uh, this uh, is Dr. Greg Blaney from Canada, who in 2008 in Portugal presented a couple of case histories. Uh, progressive MS, EDSS 8.5, reverse factor 5.5, CFS patient, um, and uh, fibromyalgia. Next slide, please. <coughs> then in the Singapore uh, Asia Autoimmunity Congress, uh, Dr. Grace Belker from Germany um, talked about causative correlation between psychiatric disease and autoimmune inflammation. And she was looking at two case histories, sarcoidosis and MS both involving paresthesia, cognitive and memory difficulties. The interesting thing to note is that the end point is return to work or return to the family life. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, last year in uh, Spain, uh, Norway Singa Linseth gave a 64 subject case series demonstrating resolution of CFS and E, of course only in partial cohort uh, resolution with all the sudden, uh, the end point was return to work. So you see, our colleagues have been doing a lot of innovative work. I haven't interfered very much with them, except uh, from the point of view of uh, elucidating the science more clearly and giving them the tools that they need in order to improve um, delivery to their patients. Next slide, please. And I spend most of my time these days attending all of the, uh, well, not all of the conferences, but jumping from conference to conference, uh, keynotes and other speeches. Um, to uh, try and explain to people exactly what we've learned uh, about how microbes can cause chronic disease. And not just one chronic disease, many different chronic diseases, depending on the uh, mix up of the makeup of the microbiome, uh, makeup of the interactome. Next slide, please. So we've had quite a lot of interaction with FDA review divisions over the last seven years. In 2005, we applied for orphan designation in sarcoidosis. Um, we got a partial designation uh, in that, but it was basically rejected. Um, certainly we couldn't move forward with the designation and go to a farm. Um, we also got an application of rejection in PTLDS, post Lyme disease syndrome. 2007, we had a high-level meeting organized by uh, OSHI with uh, Bob Temple and a number of other division um, uh, directors and, and uh, deputy directors. 2010, we applied for orphan designation in multiple sclerosis, uh, progressive multiple sclerosis, and uh, myotrophic level sclerosis. And just last year, we, we filed an exploratory IND um, in conjunction with the University of uh, California, San Francisco, ALS clinic. And uh, DNP, well, I said through the book, Alice, that was the words that came to my mind. Next slide, please. Because what we did was, about a decade ago, we figured out that we could reverse some of these microbial damage pathways uh, with a drug that had already been approved. And we used the special in silico research, very advanced uh, computing research, 
um, to show exactly what Olmosartan did in some of the nuclear receptors that are key to the innate immune system, particularly the VDR. And we found that if we changed the dosing of the Olmosartan so that the concentration remained approximately constant in the bloodstream, that they had very profound effect in the nuclear receptors and that they were able to partially reactivate uh, the immune system, the innate immune system, which is knocked, knocked down, gradually knocked down by the, the microbes. So by 2012, our collaborating physicians in Europe were reporting that a purified form of the drug, a purified formulation of the Olmosartan drug, seemed to be more effective in dealing with neurological degradation in progressive MS patients. And at this time, USCSF's ALS patient was stable on the older tablets and wanted to change to the purified Olmosartan. So they asked us, will you act as sponsor to get the uh, purified Olmosartan for the UCSF patient? Next slide, please. And the changeover study that UCSF wanted to do, or we wanted to do as well, um, is basically this, just an exploratory study. We just want to see what happens. We're just academics. We don't really know what uh, the uh, purified form is going to do. And in the USF, UCSF ALS patient who was stable and surviving uh, three years onto a, a, a FDA approved impure drug ester tablet being prescribed on label, we wanted to change to a lower dose, 25 instead of 40 milligrams of the purified homosartan in capsules with no filler. Uh, and if the new formulation didn't work, the patient would be immediately swapped back to the tablets. Next slide, please. Well, what happened was a full clinical hold was placed on our study proposal. And um, I've got here, this is a week old, these slides. The Office of Compliance seized our research capsules. It's worse than that. Last Friday, I got a communication from a Homeland Security uh, threatening me with criminal um, uh, prosecution if I don't destroy all the investigative drug before the 13th of uh, March. Three weeks, almost two weeks for me. So we had originally intended to extend our US-based studies to MS, the same as they're doing in Europe, and neuropsychoidosis, but we'll now have to collaborate with the universities overseas to move those studies forward. I say patients were able to travel. I didn't know if you could still access these things, that the rules may have changed since I did these slides last week, but ALS patients doesn't help. They're often too sick to travel. So they'll have to wait until um, FDA decides to allow us to start research here in the USA. Next slide, please. And I was trying to figure out, you know, I went to a presentation by Hock Temple in November, where this is one of his slides. If you look at the last paragraph, it basically says what many of the speakers have said here today, that physicians and patients are generally willing to accept greater risk or side effects. This is a side, this is a known safe drug. It's used by millions of people for treating high blood pressure. We've changed the dosing, true, but we know exactly what the dosing is, and we've done the pharmacokinetic simulations, and hundreds of patients have been using the same dosing with the uh, off-label uh, for uh, years, uh, 10 years. Next slide, please. And I came across an IND. I was given this IND um, concerning IPEX. Next slide, please. I'm running out of time, so we'll cut to the chase. I put a summary of what I read this paragraph as saying. It says, if the drug works, then all the ALS patients were wanted, and what role will that leave for us at the FDA? You can read the actual legal language there as well if you don't like my uh, summary. Look, when I started 35 years ago in clinical research, all of us had one goal in mind, and that was to cure disease. Cure disease, that was the only goal. And the way we were going to do that was to use science. And what's happened over the last 35 years is the focus has shifted to science being the goal in itself, science being the end in itself, and we've lost focus on the need to cure disease. Next slide, please. Um, Margaret Hamburg said one of the problems FDA is struggling with that they're relying on 20th century approaches for review, approval, and other side of treatments and cures of the 21st century. But look, I also want to point out that Albert Einstein reminded us that we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. I have overcome, overcome both of those problems. I'm obviously a 20th century uh, scientist, and I'd be happy to work with the FDA to help them overcome 
um, those barriers as well. But please, let's get some communication going instead of sending the Department of Homeland Security on there. Thank you very much.